enjoy his presence. Amen. Uh, heaven's going to be filled with singing and praise. And that's just a part of it. I believe we're going to be doing great things and learning more and more. Maybe we'll get our questions answered, but maybe we won't remember our questions. I don't know. Who knows? But maybe we'll just know. God hasn't told us everything yet. Hallelujah. God doesn't tell us everything yet. So what does that mean? Well, I think we read somewhere that the just shall live by what? Faith. Oh, so that means I don't have to know everything yet. Right? I don't, I don't have to understand everything yet. And how many say, I don't understand everything yet? Yeah. And so how in the world do you explain some events in our lives, some, some people that get sick and are taken and accident, whatever it may be, why do young children die? I don't have all the answers. I know this because sin entered into the world. We all have the same problem. We are reaping the results of what sin produces death. The good news is Jesus came to give us life and take back the keys of death. This reminds me of a story this week. Now I had a key that opened the door going to the woods that the forestry gave me. I felt elite. I felt special. I had a key to the gate. And nobody else could go through but me. Turns out the key was starting to give me trouble, or at least the padlock was getting to give me trouble. So I got in, but then I was coming out, and oh boy. <laughs> After about 45 minutes went by, I was working the key, working the key, and working the key. I called the forester. He didn't answer. Oh, I remember he's on vacation. Oh, I'll call this other forester. Sure enough, he answered. He said, well, here's my story. Here's my deal. I'm on the wrong side of the gate trying to get out, and the key won't work. Have you ever been on the wrong side of the gate and can't get, get out of it? <laughs> One thing did again, but you can't get out. You feel locked. You feel trapped. So I explored my options. I thought, well, maybe this trail, maybe this, man, nah, I don't think so. And so I had to skid steer on my trailer. I'm thinking, well, my last ditch effort will be I will blow, bulldoze my way around this gate if I have to. And I was just about ready to do it. And I thought, well, I'll try one more time. That reminds me of the story of the, you know, that frozen uh, sewer line that winter. Remember that story? Just at the last second I gave up, she broke loose. And sure enough, I, I tried. I've been praying. Carrie, Carrie knew what she was praying. I've been working and I'm working. I was doing pretty good. I wasn't getting too mad. <laughs> I, I, I was trying to keep, you know, I was trying to keep an ear. Lord, you know all about this. You see my dilemma here? And I worked it again. Work it and work it. You got the pliers in, and that could be dangerous because you need to break the key off inside the. Oh boy! And so that was turned. It turned, but it wouldn't would release. But finally, I worked it, worked it, popped open. Oh my goodness! Prayer does work. Well, God, thank you, Lord. I don't have to wreck the forest. I don't have to, you know, take this thing off. The keys are important. God has a key for your situation. God has a key to unlock the captive. You lock the prison doors. God showed up. And Paul and Silas were singing praise in the jail. God showed up. What is he, what, what are you doing, Lord? Why am I locked? Why, why is this happening to me? That's the question. We all get sometimes. So we're going to talk about gratitude a little bit. Thanksgiving week, of course, expect something. How many are thankful for something today? 
In fact, you're thankful for many things. Family is important. Loved ones are important. Health is important. My dad who lived to be 97 always said, if you have your health, you could be blessed. You could be thankful. You could have your health. He may not have made a lot of money, but he had, he had, his, he had the Lord. He was a lot happier than many folks that have a lot of money. So that doesn't fix the problem that we have. Money doesn't fix nothing. Well, it helps. We all need a little to get along. And God says, I'll provide everything you need. And Paul, from a prison cell, wrote Philippians. How about that? Maybe if Paul would not have been put in prison, we would not have the letter of Philippians to read today. Could it be that Paul... Could it be that God uses your trials to encourage someone else outside of the faith or inside the faith as well? Christians ought to get along, right? Amen? Not always so. Paul said it to this letter in Philippians chapter 4. Yeah, I'm going to introduce this chapter because... I don't know who these people are, only though there are names that are, who in the world would call their child Udia and Sinchik? I have no clue. Maybe, maybe, Vern, you could do a study on them. The Wednesday night, excellent teacher. He said, I urge <coughs> Udia and Sinchik to live in harmony in the Lord. Oh. Sparks flew. Evidently, they had conflict. Guess what? The church is not without conflict. Guess what? The home is not without conflict. You know that. That's how we, how we deal with it. Everybody's smiling. Ah, I feel right at home. Good thing. I'm with real people. Real people have real feelings. Sometimes our feelings get hurt. Sometimes our feelings are overlooked. Listen, the Lord knows your feelings more than any person on this earth. The Lord knows when you're down. The Lord knows when you're discouraged. The Lord knows when you wonder why. And he says, on in verse 3, indeed, true comrade, I ask you also to help these women who have shared my struggle in the cause of the gospel, together with Clement also and the rest of the fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. What did Jesus say? Rejoice that your names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Oh, my. Oh, haven't we got so much to be thankful for? Right there, that's enough to be thankful for. That's, that's enough right there. Then he goes on to say, Rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice in the Lord always. Remember that song? And what was the, what's the next verse? Uh, and again I say, Rejoice. Paul must have knew that song. That's why he put it in the Bible. I will say rejoice because Jesus died for me, conquered sin and death. He who knew no sin became sin that we might be the righteousness. He makes us righteous. So now we're getting into these verses that you all know by heart by now. I'm sure you've memorized these verses. At least you'll hear and you'll know, oh yeah, yeah, that's, that's the ones. Verse 5, let your forbearing spirit. Verse 5. There it is. Let your, for, let your gentle spirit be, this is a different translation. 
Let your forbear, let your gentle spirit. What comes out of you and I when we're when we're hit with something that's not good? What comes out of you and I when we're put in the test, so to speak? That's a good question for me. What comes out of my mouth if I'm under pressure? But all of a sudden the engine blows oil everywhere. <laughs> yeah, we'll get into it, but that's another story though. That's not a good sign. That's like the blood of an that's like your blood pouring out of you in a motor. If you're losing engine oil, you 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 got problems. Rejoice. Did I rejoice? No. Not at the moment. I was in shock. Lord, I can't believe this. I wasn't saying that necessarily. But I just said, I can't believe this. Am I having a nightmare? You know how it is. You've been go, you, you've been, maybe you were traveling, and all of a sudden something starts going wrong. What is going on here? God, you said you'd be with me. But why is this happening to, to us now? What comes out of you and I? The question is, number one, number one question, what, let me get it right, what's your light like these days? What, how, how, how are people viewing you? What do they see? What do they see? And this is a challenge. And this is to be an encouragement to you and I. Because Jesus said, you are a light set on a hill. Duluth is a good picture. Some of you like to go to Duluth. That, that hillside with the lights at night. You can't, you can't but say, wow. Where the world is looking on at the church, they they may not say it, they they may not come up to to us and say, you know, oh you're you're such a good person, and oh I just want to, you know, uh uh-uh. uh, they're in a battle. Satan has them in a stronghold. The full Nelson of some of you wrestlers. Full Nelson is a tough hole to get out. And he wants to break people. And bring them so down that they'll never get a taste of the Lord. But guess what? God's, God came to this world when people were locked up tight. People were shut in. People were in slavery. In bondage. Jesus comes to set the captive free. Because the good news is this. Jesus comes as a light. He comes as a light to shine the darkness. How many of have a few have had to use a light lately because of our season we're in? Right? You're blundering around. I had trouble when they rearranged the seats. When I came over here, I don't know when it was. I usually come here early I come here Saturday, but then I come really early Sunday morning to just get myself going. I don't know how many times I tripped over. I thought, what in the world? Somebody's messing with the church. They moved the chairs on me. Austin did it. No, I'm just kidding. Light is a good thing. I love this. I love the sunrises lately, if you can see them, or <laughs> that time of the year. But you, have you noticed the sunsets lately? Brilliant. You don't get these colors. Only this time of the year you get these kind of colors. There's a light that shines into darkness, and the darkness is exposed. And at the moment we say yes to Jesus, our heart becomes alive. A place where the seed of God, the seed of seats in our, sits within our spirit, is his spirit bearing witness with your spirit. That light 
that Jesus talked about sinners don't like the light because they're afraid. They like the darkness. My, our light is not dependent upon our feelings. Our light is not dependent upon what you feel like. Your, your light is, a, is dependent upon Jesus inside of you. You see, I think that here's what we get some, here's what we need to be real, folks. Even Christians get, get into pickles. Even Christians get into troubles. troubles. But the, the difference is they have the light of Jesus in their life and they realize this is just temporary. Right? Paul said a momentary affliction. Momentary affliction. What does he say? In comparison to all eternity that's coming. This is just a breath, a bloom, a second. The Lord says to you and I, let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works. So to my, my light, my light needs to be Turned on when I go to the workplace. The light of Jesus. People are reading you. People are observing. But they see by your good, you are the best worker because Jesus is in you. You have the best attitude when Jesus is in you. What should we be talking about these days? What should be a converse, what should our conversation be on these days? And I'm talking about people that are in the church and people that are yet to come to faith. What, what would you say to a person that you never would say, see them again if you had the chance to witness? Let me ask you this myself and you too. My question is, what should we say to people, perhaps if we're never going to see them again, and we know they need Jesus? Where do we start? Sometimes it can be just a word or two that will give a little seed, just plant a little seed. People may be saying, yeah, I had a friend who just said that this, this was, yeah, it, it just, the world is going to the, you know, basically H E double hockey sticks. I mean, that's a pretty sobering thought. But the Bible says the world isn't going to get better. Well, we know that, but the church needs to get better. The church needs to get, see, the more the darkness, the brighter the light. Could it be that God is preparing us that people are going to come to you and I more and more and say, what, what, what's happening? You go to church, you, you seem to have faith. How do you have that? And Paul says, be ready instant and season. Then we give an answer. And so to give an answer means, well, I just accept the Lord and I believe what he says in his word. Oh. And maybe give him an invitation. To, you know, I've said this sometimes. When, when, when you lay your head on the pillow at night, and you're all alone, talk to God. Ask him to come into your heart. Ask him to be your Lord. Talk to him about what you're going through. Talk to him about what, what's bothering you. He's there. Sometimes our light goes a little dim from time to time if we're, if we're not careful. What do you mean, Pastor? There's a little thing on engines that's called the alternator or a generator or something like that that charges the amps or the electricity to the battery. 
where it helps keep the motor running, but also when you turn your lights on, you're not groping through the dark, trying to, oh my goodness. A tear, oh, you know, it's like, you know, it's hard enough when you get older to, to see, but if you got lights that are dim, it's really tough. And so here's our advice, here's what the Lord says, draw near to me and I draw near to you. In other words, we've got to go to the charger. Let ourselves be refreshed. And so let's, let's think about that. We're on the charger. When we, when we turn to his word, we're on the charger. When we talk to God, we're, we're getting the charge. When we praise him, we're beginning to feel the charge of the Holy Spirit. And see, we're nothing more than humanity. We're nothing more than, as Paul said, oh, wretched man that I am. He knew that his flesh was weak. But then he reached out. Rather, Jesus reached out to him, and then it turned around, which brought him into a fellowship with the Lord. And his prayer life began to take on a whole different dimension because he knew now who Jesus really, really was. He didn't know before. He prayed to God. Somehow he thought he was doing God a favor by killing the Christians off, persecuting them. But we find that Paul is a different Paul now. The soul turned to Paul. Now we have Paul that is reaching out to people all over around his world. He is going, taking the gospel. He's risking his life. He's in threat and danger, exposed to hunger, cold. On and on the list goes. And he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Verse 6, this is classic. We can phrase it however. We can try to, you know, make it pretty. But we all get anxious from time to time. Anxious. Anxiety fills us. Overwhelmed. We get ourselves in a bind. We feel like we're sinking. We feel sometimes, well, what's the use or what's the hope? But he says, be anxious for nothing. He's learned the discipline to bring himself to the Lord and pray about everything. And, and not only pray, but pray with thanksgiving. Pray with thankfulness. Pray, begin your prayer with, thank you, Lord, that you are who you are. Period. If you don't do any, anything else for me. You see, I'm, I've said this often. I think the Lord is quite more interested in the prayer, prayer, as much as he is in answering the prayer. How does that work? Well, if you, you don't learn how to pray, you don't learn how to talk with God, and you don't learn how to listen, and then you become, oh, you start to t formulate opinions, and you start to walk in your own uh, thinking and trust in your own understanding, and that's not scriptural at all. Is it? And the deeper you go in your prayer life, the less anxiety the less it lightens the load. All of a sudden, it's not your responsibility, it's God's responsibility. Well, God, now you've got a problem, don't you? God, I have a problem, but you, you know how to fix it. You know what, you know what I need to do. And I've learned that there, there are people that God will use in my situations Especially when it comes to mechanical things, I don't have a clue. God has people that He's gifted. Guess what? God wants to use the body of Christ. Amen. God wants to use everyone, and we talked about this a few weeks ago. Everyone has a special, unique calling, and together we can get more done than by ourselves. And therefore, it glorifies God. And so we pray 
Lord, I had a, an adopted, a, a grandmother in, in my church growing up, and she was a grandmother widow lady. She adopted me. She didn't say that. She didn't. It, it was obvious because when I delivered her wood, she said, oh, sit down here. Now sit down. And I knew what was coming. It was going to be a lesson, a something out of her life, a story that would illustrate God's grace or God's faithfulness. She lost her husband at a youth. She was a, a widow uh, at a young, I said, a young mother had several children. She says to me, "Yeah, I, I had to, I had to raise my kids on my own." And I scrubbed floors, and I did all this stuff to keep food on the table. Linda, you know who I'm talking about, Lydia. And she, she had these conditions later in her life. And she shook, and, and she, she'd get out of breath. And she had a nicotine problem in her younger years, actually up into her older years. She loved the Lord. She never could get victory over it. But she would... She would Tell me this, Jerry, and this is now I was in the ministry, and tell us, if I call you and I'm out of breath, you start to read the Psalms. And she told me the Psalms to read. And so sure enough, she, she'd call and I could hear her breath. And she was gasping for breath, and I'd start to read the scriptures. And pretty soon she'd start to say, praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Hallelujah. And all of a sudden, she was talking. Unbelievably. She trained me. She was training me more than, more than I got. Well, I'm not going to. College was good. It was all good. But there are people that can teach you and I. Individuals by their life story, their testimony, how God intervened. And it will stick with you, and it will carry, and it will encourage you. That's why your light is so important. You don't know who's watching you from a distance and seeing how you live, how you're responding in the days that we're living in. How are you taking things? And I want to encourage you. If you talk to the Lord about things that are on your heart, he is absolutely crazy about you talking to him about that because he wants to be involved. He wants to be the Lord. He wants to be the one who gives you the, 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 re, the, the answer. And so, for our life, what our light shines. And then thirdly, our mindset. Mindset, 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 mindset. Mindset. I cannot always change my circumstances. I can only change how I think about it. My attitude. It comes back to attitude. Am I going to let this destroy me or am I going to let this be another stepping stone? It, it, I think it's a lot to do with settling it in, settling it in prayer. And Lydia would say this, Often to me, the Lord knows all about it. The Lord knows all about it. And he knows all about it. Before we even ask. But he says, ask and you shall receive. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Seek and you shall find. He wants your relationship. He wants your heart to be toward him. He wants your heart to love him no matter what happens in this life. It, it could be a test. He doesn't want anything to come between him, you and him. He doesn't want idols in our lives. He doesn't want things that take his place. He doesn't want things that take up his time. And on and on and on it goes. Because Jesus... Spent so much time with the Father even when he was on the earth. He role modeled his prayer life. He talked to his Father. He was there all the way. Mindset. 
I have a choice. We didn't read verse 7, but there's a promise that comes about when you pray about it. You know what it is. It's the peace. You get peace. And then finally, don't you like it when the preacher says finally? In conclusion, doesn't mean nothing. Finally, oh, finally we get to go home and eat. No, oh. you know what's, you know what? My mother used to put a roast in the oven. We could smell it before the church was out. You know, we start thinking about it. The roast to take care of itself. Finally. Like God is saying, now here's the final word. Here's the clincher. Brethren, whatever is true, and I'm not going to read the whole list. You read it on your own. It's all about what you think on. What is good? What is lovely? Anything worthy of praise. Let your mind dwell on these things. You know how it goes. If you think the worst, it'll be the worst. If you're looking for the negative, it'll happen. Right? More chances than not. But what if you think about what's the best? What if you begin to believe God is going to do something good in my situation? God is going to take my mess and make something good. Turn it around. Every time the enemy tried to steal something from you, you need to remind the enemy that God is going to to give you a whipping. He's going to make it rough on you. Satan runs when you begin to praise the Lord. When you begin to say the name of Jesus, when you begin to say the blood of Jesus is over me, the blood of the Lamb is applied to my heart, my health, the blood of the Lamb is applied to my mind, mindset. I am a child of the King. I am a child of God. I have been redeemed. I am not worthy. I cannot save myself. But because of his sacrifice, because he came down to this earth, gave himself a ransom, in which we're going to celebrate the Lord's Supper. One of the ways the Lord reminds us in Scripture to keep the right mindset is to remember the the sacrifice, the offering of the, of the body of Christ. And so I leave you with one more verse. One more verse. The mindset can either be a negative or it can be a positive. The old, I say the old, the old nature in me, the old man in me wants to think on the negative. But the, the real Gary, the real spirit that Jesus created has been created to think on the positive. And Paul said the same things in Romans. There was this struggle going on. There was this battle going on. And that's there where we need to engage and become intentional about dealing with our mindset. And so we leave you with this. Jesus said, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things, things, what are the things? Well, he talked about the food, the clothing, the, the basics, things. We only need a few things, just a few. The world says you got to have this, and you got to have that, you got to look this way, and you got to, you know, we don't need those things. The mindset 
was simple. There's no hearses going to heaven. I mean, there's no no U-Hauls going to heaven. There's no there's no luggage. You go back as we came. Naked, we are born into this life. We return. The day will come. Mindset. That we're trusting while we're here, while we're on this earth, to do the best we can with the Lord's help. And we're going to serve the communion. Chet, would you help me? You were willing to. We just invite you. You know, Jesus, um, you're, you're here to celebrate together. If you don't know Jesus, this can be your step toward knowing Jesus. And we'll walk you through this. Everyone's going to just kind of hold your, your emblems. And just, there's, two, there's two little tabs. We'll figure it out. And then we're ready to go. God gave his life for you and I. Jesus, we're so thankful. When you gave, when, we, when you gathered your disciples together, As we know, the Last Supper, you talked about a day that would come when we will eat eat the Lord at the Lord's table, the marriage supper of the Lamb. That day is to coming, but until then, He says, "Do this from time to time." Because sometimes we just need something tangible to remind us, our mindset, that he gave it all. He paid it all for you and I. I'll read the verses and we'll take together and then we'll sing a song in conclusion. And when he had given thanks, reading from Paul's letter to Corinth, he's referring to Jesus. When he had given thanks, he said, this is my body which is for you. We do this in remembrance. We thanks. We thank you, Lord, you gave your body, you allowed yourself to be broken, bruised, beaten, almost to death. By your stripes we are healed, he says in Isaiah. By your scourging, Lord, you, we have healing. And I now pray that this also represents the healer. The healer. And so let's receive together. We receive, Lord, we accept what you've done for us. We also can walk in your strength, walk in your newness. We're no longer our own. The same way he took the cup after supper, which means he, he, he dipped it, sucked it. He said, this is the new covenant. What does that mean? We don't have to bring the blood of bulls and goats and Sacrifices, he became a sacrifice. So this is the new covenant in my blood. His blood cleanses more, cleanses everything. And so this do this as often as you drink it, remember, remember to day. Thank you, Lord, for the blood of Jesus that was shed. Or this represents the blood, that your blood is beyond any other blood. It's the blood. A Jesus that continues to wash us, keep us. And we receive this together. And we just praise you, Lord. The moment of victory. He didn't stay in the ground, he didn't stay in the grave. He paid it all. 